I'm Martha. Thanks for joining me, friend. Hey, Tashin. Great to be here. So I've been really looking forward to this. Uh, you know, we got to spend some time together, uh, I guess, a couple of months ago uh, at your house. And that was really lovely. And we got to some talking about some topics about, you know, religion and Catholicism and your past that I, you know, I knew about, but it was lovely to hear about. It's like, oh, we, we got to dive deeper into that. And there's also some other things I'd love to talk about. So I'm excited to hear more from you and and share this conversation with the world. And um, yeah, so I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Yeah, um, it's exciting. <laughs> so one thing I wanted to mention is uh, it's become kind of a standard on this podcast that I start by asking people about their life story, which is, you know, it's, it's a big question. It's a big question to start off right at the bat, uh, right off the bat. Like, what's your life story? And <laughs> I thought it'd be good to share a little bit about what this question means to me and why it's important and why I ask people, because I think this has been obvious for me to me for a long time, but maybe, you know, some things that are obvious to you might not be obvious to the listener or, you know, to someone who's coming on. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. And then I'll ask you the question, which, uh, you know, what is your life story? My favorite question. So um, <laughs> I think that people are just incredible. You know, I meet a lot of people in my life and my travels and my work and my projects and every person is just mysterious to me. You know, I I met someone recently and I, I, I spent like six hours with them last night, just talking to them like, wow, this person's incredible. And there's ways in which they're different than anyone I've ever met before. And everyone's kind of like a world unto themselves. And I think mm -hmm. everyone has that kind of beauty or depth. And this podcast is really a venue to explore one person. Like who is this person today? Who is Martha? You know, I've been interested in you for a while, curious about you. We've been friends for a while. It's like, this is a time to honor you and get to learn about you. And to me, it makes sense if that's sort of the container to start with, hey, how, you know, what's happened to you in your life and how do you view it? And um, that's, that's what the life story question is. And, you know, there's no real wrong way to answer this question because it's, it's your life story, right? It's the person's life story. And um, there's not a right answer. There's not a wrong answer, but it's, it's yours and you can make it yours and answer any way that you want. You know, some people answer very briefly. Some people answer very long answers, you know, theoretically, we could talk for hours just answering this one question, <laughs> right? Um, right? I'd be very down for that. And uh, I think it really gives you a sense, of course, like factually of what someone's done with their life, you know, oh, I went here and I was born there and I, this and that, but also, also of like the sense that someone makes of who they are and their place in the world, you get a sense of that. And then that, that I find that context, establishing that shared context, both between me and the person who's the guest, and the listener, right, um, creates a richer conversation. And it's been so common that like the last 30 or 40 minutes of these podcasts is just so rich. And for me, the most typically the most fulfilling part of the conversation is like at the end. Um, and that I think is is made from the seed and soil of this question and other questions that are prepared. Um, like it, it's sort of establishes uh, like a garden bed where like beautiful flowers can blossom up. And so this, and, and it also adds a nice, it adds a nice like uniformity to like, I ask everyone this question and then we go down like diverging paths where we get into the specifics of a specific person. So that's, that's a little bit about what this question means to me and why it's important and why I ask, even though it's a big one to start with, but uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to sort of frame that context for you and for the folks that are listening and uh, yeah. say a little bit about that. I, yeah, we are a hundred percent same wavelength with the human person and the story. I think in college, I used to try to get into conversations in the same way. I'd ask them what their story was. And it was always surprising to me and kind of sad to me too, that sometimes people's reactions were to be like downcast, mm. that they didn't really have an interesting story. And that was so sad to me because of course they did. You know, they just didn't know it or however they were interpreting it or th they just couldn't see themselves and how amazing and beautiful they they were. So I loved. So it, it does take more than just a tell me your life story question. I mean, it kind of takes a little a, a way to ask the right questions, because like you said, that is like a ginormous question to ask someone. Um, 
I had another friend who was really good at asking prying questions. She asked like two questions and people are pouring their souls out to her. It was like, how'd you do this? Like, yeah. <laughs> um, so that's a gift that she is to the world, but, um, yeah, but to get people to open up like that. Um, and even like you said, it's a huge question and there's so many answers you could give so many stories you could tell or interpretations or depending on who you're talking to or what mood you're in, et cetera. So yeah, that's probably mm -hmm. the most of your list of questions you sent me. That was the most overwhelming one, like the story of my life. <laughs> oh, what, where do I begin? <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I guess the story of my life, I, um, I, I used to keep a, a journal and I, I called it A to A in a roundabout way, <laughs> mm. which is kind of like there and back again, a hobbit's tale, right? Mm. Um, I started, I came from God and I'm journeying back to God, but it's in a roundabout way. Like I mm. get to go on this big, it's kind of like the hero's journey that's circular, right? You start in, in one place, you go on this huge journey and you end up at the same place, but you've grown, you've, you don't return the same um, so anyway, that's kind of how I see my life and everyone's life really, um, in that lens. Uh, so my own, I mean, in terms of my childhood, I guess an important thing to know is that my dad was in the military. And so I grew up with this kind of warrior attitude and self-discipline and willpower and being strong and tough and no pain, no gain. Pain is only weakness leaving the body. And, you know, that, that whole attitude I wanted to be a mighty warrior and and I actually was kind of upset with God because he spoiled me you know like do you want me to be soft like what what's going on here I want to be this mighty warrior I want to do great sacrifices and amazing things and I just have this really easy cushy life you know I have parents who love me and I have I we're not poor or anything we're not in some war struck country I mean just like I have a really easy life like what are you doing to me uh, um, but that's kind of been how he's treated me my whole life is he's just spoiled the dickens out of me. Um, uh, even though, yeah, anyway, he, but, uh, he works with everyone differently, of course. Um, but anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. I'm talking about God's story, but that's, that's how I see life. I see everything is God's story, you know? Um, and that's when I, when I first read the Bible, uh, I, you know, I used to just kind of flip through the Bible and like read certain parts just to get like moral, moral lessons from it or whatever. Um, but then when I actually sat down to read it, I'm like, I'm going to read this thing from the beginning to end. Like I would read a novel, you know, like it's a story, not analyzing it or like translating it into morals or whatever. And that's when I realized it was God's story, that he was the hero of the story. Because before, when I just read bits and snatches, I looked at the, like the people in the story, like this is the hero of this story, this is the hero of this story, whatever. But when you read as a whole, you're like, wait a minute, this is all about what he's doing, not about what the people are doing. Um, so anyway, that's that's what, um, and we each we each kind of, you know, we have it's just natural to be egocentric, you know, that we are the main character of our story, and that's just how we see everything. We really can't see it from any any other perspective because we're like trapped inside ourselves, you know. Um, but but the more you open up and realize that your story isn't being told by yourself, that it's that it's being told by the ultimate storyteller, and you aren't in control of what happens to you. All that you can do is respond to what's happening to you. Um, then. Anyway, so I'm going way tangent. Okay, so my dad was in the military. <laughs> we moved around a lot. Um, and uh, and I was raised uh, kind of evangelical Lutheran. Um, my mom was more on the evangelical side, liking to, she liked to read spiritual books and sing songs and things. Um, and I was also kind of raised thinking uh, femininity was stupid as well. That was another thing. I had an older brother who was, who was kind of, uh, uh, abusive, emotionally abusive, um, to me and my sister and my mom. Um, and now it turns out he really was 
psychologically something there were issues you know like as an adult he was diagnosed as a sociopath and now he's in a group home etc so yeah there were issues there with my brother so that's where a lot of my insecurities and lack of self-confidence etc and just thinking growing up thinking I was stupid and terrible and mm -hmm. all that stuff came from him um and I grew up a tomboy because, uh, you know, I thought the best way to avoid his ridicule was to become more like him, right? So I, I grew up, uh, so I was into boy things and and poo-pooed girl things and um, uh, and that kind of thing. So, so on the one hand, I had my dad, who was all about being a mighty warrior and self-discipline, and I had my brother, who was uh, all about or who was very negative so you know I say I had a cushy cushy childhood with no trials but there were trials there but they were like emotional trials which everyone has different trials in life some just are more apparent than others you know um yeah and then when I really flourished was when I really started flourishing was in high school um at one point Actually, let's back up. In middle school, middle school was when I first started getting picked on in school. Um, and prior to this, school was a place where I actually could be myself because my brother wasn't there. And <laughs> and everyone loved me. I was funny and creative and whatever. And and I was like flamboyant, class clown, whatever. Um, but then middle school, it wasn't cool to be weird anymore. It wasn't cool to be loud and crazy and funny anymore. You had to be, you had to be a mean girl, mm. <laughs> like the Mean Girls movie, right? Um, so I decided to transform myself, you know, just like with my brother, I became more like him to avoid his ridicule. I did the same thing in middle school. I'm like, okay, these are the girls I have to emulate to not be attacked. So I watched Clueless over and over again so I could learn how to be a girl mm. <laughs> and things like that. So I transform tried transforming myself again. Um, but there was a certain point in middle school when I realized I did not like the person I was becoming. I was becoming a mean girl and I did not want to be a mean girl. So it's like kill or be killed. And I didn't want to do either. I didn't want to kill. I didn't want to be killed. So I got the heck out of there. I asked my parents if I could homeschool. And thankfully they they thought that was just fine if I stayed home and homeschooled by myself. Um, so that was one, that, and that of course comes out later in life when we decided to homeschool our kids. I did not want them to have to go through that. Um, uh, but yeah, and then, but I was lonely and at one point I remember crying at night and every now and then I would, I would cry at night and it was just this heartfelt, um, crying to the Lord. And, and this one time I asked him for a best friend, like, that's all I need. I just need one friend who just like in the movies, right. Who, who wanted to do everything with me and, was willing to love me as much as I was willing to love her. Um, and that's just one person. That's all I needed. And so, and whenever there's been a handful of times that I have done this, you know, when I really pray from the heart like that, like totally vulnerable. And whenever that's happened, it's like the Lord gets at something in me that he's actually been after for a while. And the answer is always yes, you know? <laughs> um, so in this case, I went to sleep very peacefully because I just had a sense that the answer was yes, he would take care of it. And and that's when I came across Kristen. Uh, I'm dropping names now. I'll just use her first name. <laughs> and she was this amazing person who, I mean, she was, she was totally, totally charismatic, totally beautiful and popular and all this stuff. And so I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. And she liked me. I mean, she, you know, um, and so we just started doing everything together. We were in karate together. We uh, were in junior Air Force ROTC together. Um, I ended up going back to high school for senior year so I could do 
all sorts of like AP classes and um, for college credit and activities and such. Cause I wanted to go to the air force Academy. We both wanted to go to the air force Academy, um, which, uh, which didn't work out. Uh, <laughs> she ended up getting a concussion. She got a full scholarship to air force ROTC and then she got a concussion. So that, so she lost her scholarship and she decided to enter the Marines. And I decided when I was applying to the air force Academy and everything, I just got so stressed out and I realized, wait, I really don't even want to go anymore. You know, like, why am I doing this to myself? Um, and then I got a pamphlet from UND, which is a college my parents went to, University of North Dakota, about the about the honors program and how they have comfy couches and they do discussions all the time. I'm like, wow, I want comfy couches. <laughs> so I went from like gung-ho military person to like laid back comfy couch college student <laughs> I'm like well that sounds wonderful um but you know it was North, North Dakota so it's still not too comfortable uh, <laughs> I even wrote an essay to for a scholarship uh, like why why I was choosing to go there and I said because warmth is for the weak <laughs> This is just showing like my attitude at the time. I still had this like warrior mental. I was like taking cold showers at five o'clock in the morning just to be tough, you know, just like whatever, all self-discipline and stuff. Um, you know, and I really admire like Lord of the Rings is a huge story that I admire. And I always thought about like um, Aragorn and Boromir and all these like hardened warriors who could live out in the wilderness and they were strong enough to protect the weak like the hobbit they were protecting the the hobbits and i'm like i want to protect people i don't i don't want to be this weak wimpy little hobbit i want to be the warrior who's protecting the weak, weak wimpy little hobbits right but anyway that's not really my story though is it <laughs> um that's another hard part of this question is it's so hard to interpret your own story. And it's gotten me in a lot of trouble mm. trying to, trying to basically anticipate what my own story is, you know? Um, but, but we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, so I went to college and I was super extroverted. I thought I was an introvert my whole life just because I was so put down, but I was totally extrovert um, all over the place crazy person uh people accuse me of being drunk quite often but I never was I was just I was just drunk on life and excited to be alive every day and mm. an ambassador of fun for everyone hey let's go dress up in costume and and maraud around the campus you know I mean we didn't have we didn't have TikTok or YouTube back then it would have been great we could have filmed ourselves but we just did it without filming ourselves because it was fun you know mm. um yeah. So, so that was fun. And then it was in college that I met, uh, the, the RA on my floor, uh, her name's Katie and she was, uh, I'm, I'm going to say an extremely, extremely holy person. Now, when I say holy, I know there's probably an image that comes to mind, like, mm, you know, but that's not what I mean. Uh, like, Holy equals boring and stuffy to a lot of people, right? But holy is not boring or stuffy. She, she, it just means that she, I mean, I could call you holy, Tashin. I mean, you, you love people. You really, you really look at them. You're really open to, um, it's the loving kindness thing, um, and that's what she was with every everyone um even though she had tons of personality and tons of craziness too but and she and she also i mean in terms of christian holiness holiness is just friendship with god basically you know like you know him you love him and you want what he wants um even if even if sometimes it makes you uncomfortable or something, you know, like even if sometimes you're like, oh, you frustrate me so badly, <laughs> you still want what he wants, you know? Um, it's, it's like marriage too. Um, anyway, so I met her and prior to this, I was pretty like anti-Catholic because I, I looked, 
all the Catholics I had known previously were, they didn't know their faith. They were miserable. They were burdened by guilt. This is kind of a Catholic thing is being burdened by guilt. Unfortunately, so many rules and regulations and et cetera. And my, my view of the Catholic church and studying history, <laughs> like it's not a pretty history as well, is that it was this man-made institution meant to just control, mind control people, you know, for political power is, is my, was my perception of Catholicism. Um, but we actually started a, a book club that year. Um, we called ourselves the Neo Inklings based on the Inklings that like Tolkien and C.S. Lewis were part of. And we read some C.S. Lewis works and discussed it and, and I was like, whoa, these people, these people know their faith so even more than I do. Like, where do they get all these insights? Like, what's going on here? Because um, I was used to going to Bible studies and basically being bored because because I I knew more than the other the people giving the study. The studies were just kind of surface level stuff um, that I'd heard a million times before. Uh, but but. So I was blown away by these people. And then I found out like halfway through the semester that they were all Catholic missionaries. I was like, wait a minute. Really? Um, so at that point, I was willing to accept Catholics as another as other Christians, you know, <laughs> like, oh, OK, great. They they can they're Christians, too. I love it. They know the Lord. Um, and then. The. I'm I'm gonna skip a bunch of the details. This is like my conversion story to the Catholic Church, but there's a whole lot. I mean, it's like a story in itself. But I'll skip ahead to like the next year when I, um, like I'd always wanted to go to church more as a child because I'm like, isn't this like the most important thing we can be doing? Like, why do we only go once a week? This is crazy. Uh, but I'm like, well, that's just the way it is, you know. Um, but then I found out that Catholics actually do mass every single day and they i'm like oh okay um and we actually i actually went with katie to see the passion of the christ because it had come out that year and and of course it was extremely impactful it's just one of those kinds of movies um but something that really struck me in that movie was how mary was portrayed because i had never really thought about mary before like she was just some girl that god chose to to be the mother of his son um and i didn't really think about like the intimate connection that she had with jesus from beginning to end um and it was portrayed really well in that movie um and anyway but that movie was very impactful so i remember that night i went up to katie and i asked her if i could go to mass with her the next day even though it was a weekday I'd never been to mass, a Catholic mass before, but I just wanted to go because, yeah. Um, and and when I went, she was the perfect person to go with, by the way, because she knows her her faith so well and so simply. She doesn't. She's not pushy. She just kind of teaches. And so walked in. She told me about the holy water being just a, a reminder of our baptism, and we went, and and. And we went up to the pew and she, she said, when, usually when we come into the church, we genuflect towards the tabernacle because Catholics believe that that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. He's truly present in the Eucharist and that he's in the tabernacle and you know, there's a little tabernacle light next to it, the little red light. And that when that's lit, it's just supposed to mean that he's, he's there, he's present. And when she said that my gaze was just riveted, like what, <laughs> you know, like what? <laughs> um, And so the entire mass, I was just staring at, the tabernacle staring like can this really be true like like uh because i respected her so much and i respected all these people here i had come to know them and that they are intelligent and that they're faithful and that they know i mean 
like how could I how could they believe this um so anyway and it was so different going to the Catholic mass was so different from the other churches I'd been to I kind of done some church hopping because it was all I was kind of getting tired of same old thing you know I wanted more depth and a, a lot of churches it ends up like a big advertisement like oh please support this mission trip and please give for this. And I was like, come on, aren't we just here to worship? Can we please just cut the advertising? Um, but something that struck me so much about the Catholic mass was the silence. People were actually being silent and praying and kneeling. And yeah, there was just so much silence. Whereas like a lot of the churches I've been to is like trying to entertain people. You know, you can't have, you gotta have music going all the time. Gotta feel good. Gotta have your little coffee shop afterwards. But there was something so reverent and so, so much deeper about what was happening. Um, and so many of the prayers and everything came straight from scripture. So I was like identifying one after another, like, oh, that's from there. That's from there. That's from there. Like, what are we talking about? The Catholics don't know scripture. Everything they do is from scripture, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Anyway, so, um, but the main thing was like at that moment of consecration, like when the priest says, this is my body given for you, that's when the bread and wine is supposed to become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. And I was just staring, just like, Lord, is that you? <laughs> like, I don't want to be deceived here. Like, I don't want to worship a piece of bread. That would be really bad. Like, is that, is that really you? Um, Anyway, after that experience, I decided to just delve. I could not rest until I knew more and found out like if this was the truth. Um, so, you know, I, I, I had lots of long conversations with people. It just blew me away, the answers people had and the depth of Catholic spirituality, the depth of Catholic theology, how, how much there is. A lot of people, uh, yeah, anyway, and... It was all new to me and it all made sense based on what I already had experienced in my life with the Lord. Like it all aligned. Like when I read the catechism, like that was a page turner for me, the catechism of the Catholic church. I was just, I was just devouring that thing. Like, whoa, this is truth. This is amazing. Give me more. Um, uh, so anyway, and you know, there's, so, I mean, the best thing is like just simplicity, right? So I was praying about it and I'm like, well, how can God himself be so tiny? Like come at, become a piece of bread, you know? And I'm like, well, he's God. He can do it if he wants to. Like, what the heck? How can he become a little baby? I mean, he, but he did, I believe he did that. So how is this? And he, nothing's hard for him, you know? Um, and that's where that's where he just instructed me he, directly with like simplicity, you know, cause there's all these fancy arguments, uh, and such, but I, I've never really been too into convincing, convincing anyone with like fancy words. I know there are a lot of apologists out there who give very rational arguments for things. I'm just not, I'm not interested. If I am going to convince anyone, it's just going to be through love and simplicity, you know, um, and God's basically going to do it for me and through me. I'm not going to do it myself. Um, so that's pro uh, that's one reason I don't like go around preaching to people or writing convincing things. Um, but anyway, story of my life. Let's skip forward again, which is I I was head, head all the way into the Catholic Church, like 100%. I just wanted more and more and more and more. And of course, what's the conclusion you come to when you're going in this direction? Like, I want more and more. Where can I get the most ever? A hundred percent contemplative life. I want to be a nun. You know, I just like, I don't want to do anything but this all the time. I want to pray. I want to study. I want to worship. I want to, I want every, I want to wear th I want everything that I am. I want it to be a hundred percent for the Lord completely. Um, so I couldn't leave anything better than enter a monastery. Um, I did visit a, like a teaching order, like the Nashville Dominicans. Um, but it 
but you know I looked at the retired sisters who got to stay at the convent and just pray all day I'm like can I just skip to that you know I just want to stay and pray all day <laughs> so I that I entered a contemplative like a cloistered community um and and it was even better because they had perpetual adoration and perpetual rosary and those are the two things I mean Mary and the Eucharist are the two things um that I'm 100 percent I, I mean, take or leave anything else in the Catholic Church. As long as they have got the Eucharist, I'm in. You know, um, they can. You can, you know what? You can be as corrupt as you want, do all sorts of terrible things. You got the Eucharist. I'm there. <laughs> um, I won't. I won't agree with that stuff. Like, there's a lot of saints who've been martyred in the past because they did not consent to it. I mean, Saint Catherine of Siena wrote some very angry letters to the Pope. Like, what are you doing? You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it's not. I mean, it's it's a church that's full of humans, and humans have foibles. But anyway, it's, it's, but anyway, I did. I was at the monastery for a year, a little over the year, and then I I. Uh, was I it was very very hard for me it was easy for me at first and very joyful and things but I did meet with some I mean I would call it persecution and some dis it was kind of I describe it as being like living with my brother again let's put it that way because I I described that earlier on and that's what it really felt like to me was living with my brother again and being disapproved of and once again, this is my pattern. What do I do when I'm being disapproved of? I change myself. I try to just change myself and fit in. And that is when I started to get miserable. Just like in middle school, right? I tried to change myself and I became miserable. So I got the heck out of there. And that's kind of the same story of the monastery is I was happy at first, got persecuted, tried changing myself, became miserable. And then I had to get the heck out of there. <laughs> Even though that was really hard for me because it's what I wanted. I wanted to belong to God. I wanted my whole life to be his. And I didn't know what, how else, what could possibly be better. I didn't know what, what else could possibly be better. But then I, one night I, I realized like, I don't want the best vocation. I want my vocation. And that will be the best vocation for me, you know? So and there are lots of little things like that. Like I got, I got words from the Lord and from Mary, but like very comforting. Uh, like he said, you can be mine forever. Or I, I said, when I wanted to enter the monastery, I told him, I want to enter because I want to be yours forever. And a word I got from him when I was thinking of leaving was you could be mine forever, no matter what you do. Hmm. It's like, yeah, that's true. But I would still be so disappointed, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but Anyway, I ended up leaving because uh, my my body was just deteriorating. Like we had belts and I, I had to like cut a new belt notch almost every day. Like I just got skinnier and skinnier. Uh, and it wasn't because I wasn't eating. It was just like, where did the food go? I don't know. Um, and so I left and I my parents were living in Virginia. So they picked me up and I was staying with them for a while. I, I saw our counselor for a little while just because I was a mess. I was very depressed and didn't know what to do. Um, and I decided to get into bartending. Uh, and so I went to a bartending school for a couple of weeks. And, uh, and you know, it's kind of funny because none to bartender, right? <laughs> but, I, I mean, yeah, you can point this out. But it's just like how I love Spider-Man, but I'm arachnophobic. It's like my life is just contradictory. It's okay. Yeah. But it's so funny because when I became a bartender, I, you know, the, the stereotype is that people go to the bar and, and pour out their troubles to the bartender and they listen. And it was the opposite for me. <laughs> like I would be having these awesome conversations with the people I was, you know, giving drinks to and they would be listening to all my problems <laughs> mm. be like, ah, you're so well fun. and they'd be giving me advice and being like you're amazing or whatever so it's totally it was kind of cool because you know when you when people first show up and they're out to have a good time and they're like flirting with the bartenders and and like uh you know just 
earning points with their friends by, you know, taking shots at her basically. And then they find out that I was a nun and totally zoom, transform. Like all of a sudden, this woman is not just this attractive bartender. This person has mystery and depth, just like you were talking about. Like, it's so hard for people to have that veil lifted and to see past what's just there, you know? Um, so that did it for them. So uh, that was kind of fun. <laughs> but I didn't like the environment. And eventually I realized I just need to go back to North Dakota where I'm known and loved and just be surrounded by love. That's what I needed to do. So that's what I did. There was a family that invited me to stay with them. And I just got to stay in their guest room and play with their kids for a summer. And it was amazing. And I started gaining weight again, uh, <laughs> which was a good thing. You know, I might have gained a little too much weight because I kept finishing off their peanut butter jelly sandwiches. But, you know, I was happy. <laughs> Happier anyway. Um, and then a new priest came to the Newman Center and he saw me just hanging around. So he asked me to be a peer minister that year. Um, and that was and I agreed. Um, and then, and he had relationship with, uh, something called the Bethlehem community, which is also in North Dakota. And I got very interested in that Catholic community up there. So I decided to visit them the next summer. And there was this very attractive young man there who was very witty and creative and had an amazing heart. And his name was Nat Sharp. And we uh, we became very good friends and and made a movie together and fell in love and became more than friends and got married, et cetera. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say et cetera because people listening don't necessarily know that story. You know that story. But um, but, yeah, we got married and we. Uh, uh, well, how did I go? How did I even decide that I wanted to get married. I went from monastery monastery to this, you know. There's a lot of reflecting, like, just what are the desires of my heart, you know? And at one point I just said, Lord, I just, it was like the prayer was for the best friend before. It's just like, I just want one person to share my life with. I just want one person to share my life with. And then I stopped. I'm like, wait a minute. That sounds a lot like marriage, doesn't it? Like, wait, what am I talking about? <laughs> um, and you, you know, Nat was, he was, he was a lot younger than me. And, and he, he, well, I mean, like five years younger than me and still kind of like when I first went there, I think you, I mean, when we got married, he had just turned 21, you know? Um, and so he's a young whippersnapper, but he was also very mature for his age, just based on how he was raised. Um, and, and so, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a good match and we challenged each other. Um, but, and we had to, and we like to have lots of fun together, um, and adventures, but, you know, we had our first baby. We, she was a honeymoon baby. We went to Mexico and, and, uh, under the, I did not know that we had conceived our first child when we were under the full moon, smoking Cuban cigars and drinking tequilas. Uh, <laughs> but she was there. She was there, our first little baby. Um, and, you know, after after we had her and were expecting our second, we decided to move out of community uh, because... Uh, they they uh they were getting a little overbearing you know um before we had kids i was kind of invisible i was just like another member of community and i could just do my own thing or whatever but after i started having kids all of a sudden i was in the spotlight like oh you need to be doing this oh do this oh do this i'm like whoa 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 <laughs> give me, give me space give me free you know um so and it was really hard for Nat because, I mean, him leaving community was kind of like me leaving the monastery. Um, it was that devastating to him because that had been his whole life. Um, and he didn't know what else could possibly be better out there. Um, and it was especially hard because he didn't have any way of supporting us. That was another thing. All of a sudden, he never had to worry about money in his life. And all of a sudden, he has his family to support, right? So that was really hard for him. Um 
and uh yeah and he he uh, after pretty sure after our third child he shared with me that he had been thinking of I could tell he had been struggling in his faith and thinking about other things uh and reading a lot of other ways of thinking <laughs> um and he he asked me at one point what would i think if he became an atheist or if he left the church and basically didn't believe in god anymore and i said that whatever he does it depends on it all depends on god's mercy you know i mean a lot of atheists are going to heaven and a lot of catholics are going to hell I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, because God knows the heart. I mean, it's just like a, a lot of prostitutes and sinners, uh, tax collectors, right? In Jesus' time, it was prostitutes and tax collectors. And he said that they were, they were going to heaven and a lot of Pharisees and scribes who knew the law and followed it perfectly were going to hell because mm. God judges the heart. He mm. doesn't um, judge, he, uh, he's not a scorekeeping God. As I mean, that's that's one reason Catholics grow up with a lot of guilt is because that's kind of the image that's painted like, oh, this was wrong. Oh, this was good. Bad, good, bad, good. And the good has to outweigh the bad or you're screwed or, you know, like, no, not a scorekeeping God. At the very end. It's going to be love and mercy that love and mercy in your heart. Um, and he he's going to know. uh and nobody else does not even you you don't even know your own heart you know you don't you don't even know your own heart um so anyway so i looked at him and that's what i said it depends it all depends on god's mercy um and also just respecting he's on his own journey everyone's on their own journey you know like a to a in the roundabout way sometimes it's a very roundabout way um and and i'm not in charge of his journey I don't know what journey he's on. I'm glad I get to be part of it though. It's kind of, it's kind of fun. Um, but anyway, so, that, but that was really hard and it kind of, it kind of brought up other questions like, how are we going to raise the kids? Do, are we even married? Do you, what do you think about marriage anymore? You know, or different things like that. And, but there's something fundamental in both of us that have kept us together and there's something very foundational and fundamental, and I can't even really describe what it is, but there's something there that has kept us on the same page, even though it looks like we're on totally, totally different pages uh, in other ways, you know? I was always about to share something else. But... <laughs> I might as well share it, whatever. One time he asked me to go on a date with him, to a strip club <laughs> wow and i was like well uh, i you know i talked to the lord about it beforehand i'm like okay lord nat really wants me to go to this strip club like is it wrong to just go to a strip club like what i mean because i know i mean the main thing the main problem with strip clubs or anything or pornography anything like that is just that you you is just the objectification of people right which you can do just looking at someone walking in the grocery store, right? I mean, but it just kind of invites people to do it or makes it harder for them or, you know, whatever, but just the whole nature of it. But, um, but just going is, is not, anyway, I have to go through all this stuff in my mind, but it always comes down to, cause I know all the rules, right? But it always comes down to love and mercy. All these rules, 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 but they always come down to love and mercy. So I'm like, okay, I know this rule. I know this rule. So what's the way of love and mercy? I'm like, my husband would like me to come with him. And and that that might actually, I could see how going to a strip club could unlock more love and mercy in my own heart. Mm. Because I have this stereotype in my mind. The stereotype of the people who work at strip clubs, the people who go to strip clubs. And I know that they're these stereotypes that are not real people. And if I actually met real people, they'd be real, amazing, mysterious people that I could love, just like the people I see at church or in the grocery store or at home, right? 
So I went <laughs> and, and yeah, they were real people. We had amazing conversations. There's this one, one stripper there. She reminded me of my best friend from high school. She was just this very charismatic, very insightful woman. And we had a converse, great conversation with her. And she, um, you know, she, she said the same thing about it. It's like, there's something about you guys that is just, it's so deep. And so there's just something different about you. You are a unique couple. She didn't say unique. I forget what she said, but I, I left, I left feeling so uplifted. Um, and I think that, and I think that had a great time too. Well, he felt more connected to me, mm. you know, he felt so much more connected to me through that experience. Um, and yeah, just the Lord can, uh, like, like he said, you know, I can be his forever, no matter what I do. Um, and, and there's just more confirmation. It's like, yeah, go to the strip club. You, you, he trusts me, you know, God trusts me. Um, and Nat trusts me and I trust Nat, uh, et cetera. But anyway, did I tell my life story? Am I done now? I got married to Nat. We left. He left the Catholic church and we still have kids. Yeah, but we were really poor. We moved south because, you know, warmth is for the weak and I'm weak. So we moved. <laughs> I'm also weak. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're right for weakness. Um, yeah. So we moved south and, and we, you know, we were very poor and it was really hard and stressful on Nat. Um, and we, uh, you know, he got into, I, we, he got into uh, software and then I decided to get into software. And after I got in, I'm like, you know what? Why don't you take a break? <laughs> You've been doing this for a long time under a lot of stress. Why don't you take the kids and I'll take the the pressure of supporting the family, especially since I'm the one who wants all this expensive stuff. Yeah. I want a house in a nice neighborhood. I want to be able to travel and have an RV and have kids and activities and all this stuff. It's all me. And there's so much pressure on him to try to make me happy. Um, so, you know, he can make me happy just by hanging out with the kids and being on Twitter, Twitter all day. And I can be happy being ambitious and doing also making lots of money. Um, <laughs> um, which is also contrary to all these other Catholic homeschool families. We just don't fit in anywhere, Tasha. We just don't fit in. It's like, here I am. I'm part of this like homeschool co-op for the kids, but I can't volunteer because I work full time. All these other moms, their husbands are the engineers and they're the ones at the with the kids and doing all this stuff. And anyway, yeah, we just don't fit in anywhere, but it's okay. It's kind of, it's kind of fun. <laughs> um. And, you know, the RV life, we got to try that out and settled in Alabama when we were expecting our fifth, fifth baby. And that's where we are now. Mm. And we just got this fellowship. So now it's a new adventure. It's all sorts of crazy stuff. Very fun. Can you say what the fellowship is for someone who might not know? Yeah, we uh, actually, this is part of the story. It's like, I actually, at the beginning of the year, end of last year, I was starting to just get really tired of my job. Not my company. My company and my team were great. Like if I was going to have to a software job, like that would be a good one to have, you know, but just, I wanted to be free. Um, I was getting tired. Um, so I asked Nat, so I just told Nat, I'm like, Nat, we got to find an exit strategy. We got to find an exit plan for me. You know, like I, we found a way for you to be free. Now we need to find a way for me to be free. And he, he came through for me. <laughs> he, he felt all those, all those years of being on Twitter finally paid off. Right. <laughs> Who knew? Um, yeah. So he came across the, this uh, fellowship program through O'Shaughnessy Ventures. And he, he'd been friends on Twitter with Jim O'Shaughnessy for a while. So that's kind of fun. He's the, he does gifts all the time. Um, and uh, so Nat said, well, maybe I should apply for this. And like, well, why don't we apply together? And uh, so, so yeah, we applied for it. And, and uh, we were one of the first two fellows, fellows selected. And our pitch video was about making movies that we 
making movies is what brought us together. We have a passion for storytelling and we want to make more movies together. Um, but we've, we haven't been able to, cause we've had to support our family and raise the kids. Um, but this fellowship is setting us free to be able to do that again. Mm. Uh, and our, our focus f- at first, at least is going to be, uh, alternative education because we've been unschooling our kids and we just, um, we just see how, just like we want to be free, we want to be free to pursue our interests and do amazing things in the world. Uh, and we don't want to be bogged down by a bunch of, by someone else's schedule, someone else telling us what we can and can't do. Um, we want kids to have that same freedom to explore and discover and create without having to stick to a curriculum and take a bunch of tests and do a bunch of homework their entire lives because <laughs> that's what it ends up being um so anyway yeah mm. so that's the fellowship it's mm. kind of exciting mm. well i feel uh really grateful and pleased and like i've had a full meal because you you <laughs> answered my question so i want to thank you for <laughs> answering my question i know it's not easy but uh it's, it was just really beautiful to hear you share your life story and an arc of it so far. And, um, you know, I think it really comes through who you are from the way that you spoke about it as well. So I thank you for answering. And there's a lot there that I want to ask you about. And, um, you know, really right from the beginning, one of the things that kept coming up, of course, is your relationship with God and your Catholic faith. And I want to ask you um, what God means to you and what God is as you understand God. Hmm. Wow. What a question. Uh, It's like, what's your life story? It's like, Uh how do I approach it? Well, the, I mean, the first thing that just popped into my mind was he's my best friend. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that best friend that I asked for long ago is like, that's what he's always, he's always been for me. He's always been there with me and for me, someone I could talk to and rely on. Even when I felt really lonely and depressed, he was there. Um, And He's always sent me what I needed, even when I didn't ask for it, you know, because, uh, and when I did ask for it, <laughs> um, you know, he started out as when I was a kid, I saw him like a loving father, like the creator of this amazing world that I love. Like, how could you not love the one who created all this? Right? Like, what the heck? It's, it's amazing. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> um, but also not just being creator, but a, a father, like personal, like, like I'm his little child and he's taking care of me and he's loving me. Um, and he's loving me. I was always very confused because he loved me in a very different way than my own father did, than my earthly father did. Because he never asked me to be super tough or rebuked me for crying or, you know, he was a lot more understanding and gentle with me than my own father. Um, even though my, I mean, my father, my, my dad has a really loving heart, but it's just how he was raised too. Like, you know, we all are raised in different ways and, uh, and love as best we can based on how we can love. Um, but the love of my, of God has always been so much more understanding and gentler in very surprising ways like why are you spoiling me you know that's been my was my reaction and it still is like oh okay he's always surprising me with his love because anyway um so yeah as a father and and you know i believe i've always believed in the trinity father son and holy spirit but as a protestant jesus was kind of distant because he was in heaven uh like i could talk to i could and then the Holy Spirit, like, what the heck is that? You know? <laughs> um, so I, I mostly just talked to God the Father. But then when I became Catholic, I talked to, to Jesus a lot because I was actually visiting him in person <laughs> in the Eucharist. I spent hours and hours. He was always there. Like, I think my love, la- my love language, if you know the five love languages, is quality time. Mm. So the fact that he was always just there waiting for me 
and happy to see me whenever I showed up. It meant the world to me. He's just there waiting for you, you know? And so I was just there. I was drawn to him. I I, I talked to him. Um, and he, and he talked back to me, like, this is another thing is I, I, I didn't realize it was not a normal thing until I started doing spiritual direction. After I joined the church, I joined spiritual, did spiritual direction. And he said it was called locutions. Like when you actually hear a voice talking to you in your mind, and I'm like, oh, wait, that, that doesn't happen to everybody. What? You know, it's not that uncommon, I suppose. I mean, I've met other people, but, but, um, but uh, that's the way he's talked to me quite often. But um, so, 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 so Jesus, and then I wanted, I I fell head, head over heels in love. I was like a bride. He was just wooing me. He was wooing me with his romanticness and his love. And I just was head over heels. Um, and then the Holy Spirit, I... I developed more of a relationship with the Holy Spirit when I was in community. They're very charismatic, like they for, were former Baptists. Um, so they did a bunch of like faith healings and praying in tongues and uh, all that, all that good stuff that I was never a part of. Um, and so I prayed in tongues for the first time when I was visiting them at Pent. I was actually the vigil of Pentecost. Actually, I got to fight a fire first. There's just fire everywhere on the eve of Pentecost. There was this brush fire and I was like trying to dump water on it and, and it smelled like smoke. And then later that evening, I prayed in tongues for the first time. I'm like, the Holy Spirit is really, really entering my life here. Um, uh, so yeah, he's been, he's been more of a constant companion or I mean, moving me. He doesn't really talk to me. He more moves me. Um uh and I can I can feel his uh it there's a union there. There's a union there. So like I forget who talks about becoming the will of God. So like my will is God's will and his will is my will. When you when you have that union, you can I I really have learned to trust my desires and my will because the Holy Spirit, because God put them there, because God is moving in me. Um, anyway, so I need to trust it more, of course. <laughs> anyway, get a taste of it. It's, it's nice. But um, yeah, but the concept of trusting myself is very contrary to how I was raised. So that's why it's very difficult to trust myself and to believe in other people, too. Like when I say I believe in Nat or I believe in you, am I saying that you can't hurt me? Am I saying that you can't make mistakes or can't uh, uh, f um, fail to love perfectly? Like, or I, all I'm saying is that I, yeah, I, I, I believe in you that, that the Lord is working in you and I don't know how but he's there, he's doing it. Um, and so I can trust you. If I'm trusting you, I am trusting God, you know? Uh, anyhow, yeah. What did you ask me? Oh yeah, you asked me what God means for me. <laughs> I guess I'm, but basically just a constant companion, <laughs> just a constant, constant companion, um, which means a lot to me. It means I, even when I feel lonely, I don't really feel lonely. You know, it's kind of this weird both, both thing um, where I really want human companionship. But I always have that spiritual companionship, you know. Mm -hmm. um, did I answer your question? Certainly. Yes, thank you. Um, I know we've talked about this a bit in person, but I'm curious to hear if you're willing to share a bit about the various mystical experiences that you've had yeah definitely um well for one thing i will i you know i just want to say like mystical experiences are not that big a deal <laughs> and it's really good to realize that because um because it can lead to a lot of pride like when 
Like, and it did, like when I realized that it didn't happen to everyone, I'm like, Ooh, I'm special, you know? And, and the pride can come up and, and which, which is no big deal. Pride is no big deal either. Cause God knows how to handle pride. It's no big deal. <laughs> um, that's my new motto is it's no big deal. The best response to anything is it's uh -huh. no big deal. Uh -huh. Why do you think it's a big deal? Uh -huh. Um, death, no big deal, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Mystical experiences. Right. So, um, so there are a few that are really, that really stick out to me. Uh, I mean, in terms of, in terms of them talking to me, like the Mary or the saints or, or God, um, it's usually like I'm sitting having a conversation and I ask a question and I hear when I say I hear a voice, it's not with my ears, you know, it's like in my imagination because there's different powers of the soul, right? There's memory, imagination, reason, and will are the powers of the soul. This is all Aquinas, you know, Nat would be rolling his eyes at me like ah, Thomas Aquinas, all you and your words, Catholics love defining their words. <laughs> I love it. It's fun. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so he speaks to me. Oh, God speaks to me a lot through my imagination. So like, it sounds like the voice in my head. Right. Um, but you can tell it it's different because it's not coming from me. If you, uh, I, yeah. And there's been other voices too that are not good that also don't come from me. And I recognize those ones when I was a kid too, like images too. Mostly it's voices, but sometimes images. Like when I was in middle school, I had this image of myself basically killing my parents. And that, it's like he overstepped there. Or he, when I say he, I'm like, uh, the devil or whatever evil spirit was putting that image in my head is like he made an oopsie there like that was overstepping it like when he did that I realized that was not coming from me and as soon as I realized that it lost power over me and I went I actually went and talked to the pastor of our church after that and he pointed out this part in scripture it was Romans 6 or something and talking about how like uh, the good things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. And who will save me from this craziness? I'm totally paraphrasing. <laughs> That's not how it goes. This craziness. And and praise be to Jesus Christ who delivers us from all these things. But it, basically it sounded like he was talking like, whoa, you mean the Bible actually means something to me today? Like that was a huge eye-opening eye thing. Like, whoa, I got to read this thing. You know, it's not just a bunch of old stories, uh, you know. Um, but yeah, so there's bad voices too, uh, to deceive you. I mean, they want us to despair. Like that's the ultimate thing they want us to do is despair. Um, because God wants to give us his mercy and despair shut us out of that mercy. Despair is like, I'm not worthy of the mercy. I, I'm not going to receive mercy, whatever. Um, and, and, uh, Anyway, so that so there's discernment of spirits. Like if there's voices, there's certain voices that are not good and they don't come from you. There's other voices that are very loving and kind and they also don't come from you, but you can learn to um, figure out which one's which. Um, but at a certain point, I did get very confused. This was the monastery. And I basically just told everyone to leave me alone <laughs> uh, in terms of mystical experiences. Cause they just got, I, I just wanted to be normal. I, I just wanted to live a simple life. And I just said all, to all the voices, just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. And um, anyway, but like interior visions. So sometimes it's the same thing, but so it seems like the imagination, it's also like the power of the imagination so it's like an image that you're imagining, but there's a power behind it. It feels different. It's not coming from you because you're not willing it. And it it feels different and more powerful. And one 
that really stuck with me. One of the first ones was when I, I, my first spiritual direction and he was giving me a blessing afterwards. And I had a vision of, of Jesus and Mary and all the saints in heaven. And they were standing there and they were looking at me and I was standing, I was standing before them naked and, and they were just smiling at me and loving me and wel- welcoming me. And, and after, and I took it as a, and I, I knew I would be one of them. Um, and that vision has been with me ever since. Um, and there's other words that have come to me that have been with me ever since that, that I repeat often to myself. Um, <laughs> like one time I, you know, I was thinking about the different covenants that God has made, God made with like the Israelites throughout the salvation history. And a covenant is always like, I will do this and you will do this, right? It's like a little deal. Like I will be your God and take care of you, et cetera. And you will be my people and you will worship me, et cetera. It's a back and forth in exchange. So I'm like, you know what, Lord, if you were to make a covenant just with me, what would it be? And he said, I will love you and you will be happy. Hmm. <laughs> that was, that was it. I'm like, I mean, why is that a disappointment to me? Like, why would that disappoint me? It's like, where's the mighty warrior aspect? You know, I want to do these great things. Like, why don't you like tell me to go convert the world or something like that? Like, that would be more Mm -hmm. ambitious, right? I like being ambitious. Uh, So, but no, I will love you and you will be happy. Mm -hmm. That's the deal. That's it. Why is that so hard for me? Why is it so hard? to receive his love and to be a joyful child before him. Um, Anyway, so there's lots of little words like that. And they're always very surprising and challenging in unexpected ways. Like, why should that be challenging? Like I asked Mary, like, what should I do? I keep doing this. Like, what should I do? Tell me something to do. It's like, and she said, live and love. Like, that's it. Seriously. (laughs) Like <laughs> live and love. <sighs> Another image I had was of a butterfly. It was a, a butterfly flitting from flower to flower. And I realized that that was me. That's what God, that's how God saw me. That's what he wanted me to be is this bit, little butterfly. And I'm just going from flower to flower, drinking, drinking in the sweetness, enjoying the beautiful colors and I myself am also beautiful without re- realizing it. And also without realizing it, I'm I'm pollinating, right? Mm. And making more flowers without even realizing it. Mm. Um, so just be a happy little butterfly. Go for it, Martha. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, anyway, did you have any more specific questions about that? I mean, it's just kind of just something. I think that answers it for now. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. I am curious about um we we've sort of commiserated in the past about uh the uh sort of the intimacy of being asked like oh why did you leave the monastery you know which which you did answer of course in your life story but how that's you know to me it's always kind of weird it's like it's internally it's like oh why did you like leave a job or have a breakup or get divorced or something it's like oh that's like you know that like especially as a first question or something so right yeah like, it makes sense that it's top of mind that, that would be interesting to someone but also it's like oh very uh so I don't yeah. something I I am curious about that's related but I think actually even more interesting is um what what do you feel like you learned from that time you know there it was a really like a training period right you were there for a while and then you left and you know that experience is still with you and what what do you feel like Mm. you learned or how did you grow during that time Mm. oh my goodness I learned very very important very very important well in the midst of all this being broken down I was being broken down oh there was a couple things oh my goodness a couple very 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 important things let's just go with this one that um in the midst of me struggling and being totally broken down and disillusioned with myself at at one point I heard 
this was this uh, this was i think the holy spirit saying this is like put up your dukes <laughs> uh-huh. and i'm like what <laughs> I'm like, whoa, okay. Like, what does that mean? I, <laughs> um, and after that, truly, the pummeling began. Um, mm. just what left it? I felt pinned against a wall. Just boom, 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 boom. Self knowledge. He was showing me, showing me things about myself that was just like smack to the face. Uh, I mean, left and right. It was just like unending uh they call it the oh i always get the uh the where you're in the fire being purified what's that called again it starts with a c or a s i can never remember the word anyway the the fires of purification right but in my case it was the pummeling against the wall um and just realizing like i thought i thought myself i thought i was willing I thought I was willing to suffer and die for the salvation of souls and for for the Lord and his will. I thought I was willing to endure anything. And he just showed me that I wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> like, you think so? How about this? How about this? How about this? I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And eventually I... I, it was like, it was like how St. Peter, you know, Peter said, I would die for you, Lord. And he's like, oh, really? Just this very night, you're going to deny me three times, you know? And then after he did, he went out and wept bitterly. That's how I felt just weeping. When I left, I was weeping bitterly. Like I was not willing to suffer. I was not willing to stay at the monastery. Even, even if it meant that souls would go to hell, I had to go. Um, and I mean, that wasn't, I, I, that wasn't a burden that the Lord had placed on me, the, but it was one I had taken on myself, you know, and we really can't do that. Like we can't bear any burden at all, Mm. uh, unless the Lord gives us strength to do it. What strength do we have? I mean, what the heck? Um, but anyway, the result of all this pummeling and self-knowledge and disappointing of my own strength of, and sacrificial whatever was I said, well, at least I can never judge someone again. That was my conclusion. Like, there's no way I can ever judge someone again. Um. So I would say that was a good thing. (laughs) Like if the result of all that pummeling was I became more merciful towards myself and others. Well, towards others, at least becoming merciful towards myself has been a little harder because I was really, really down on myself after that. Very disappointed, very disappointed, very disillusioned. Um, But yeah, definitely merciful towards others. Um. That was the main thing I take away from the monastery. I'm very grateful because of that. Uh, Painful as it was. Mm. Mm. (laughs) And more recently, to my great joy and fulfillment, you've started uh, tweeting about your relationship with God and spirituality and Catholicism. And I'm curious how that's been for you over the last, I don't know, month or so that you've been doing that. Yeah, I'm, I started very timidly because I'd never been public about it before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was like this, uh, yeah, um, but I it's it's been in my heart to share these things like for years you know like how can you how can you have something that's been such an anchor for you and such brought you so much joy and and helped you endure through heart terrible trials uh and not share it with other people (laughs) 
you know, I've, I've wanted to, but I didn't know how or where or when. And I, and also just being down on myself, like, who am I to whatever. Um, and fearing attacks too, fear, fear of attack. Um, who am I to say this stuff? Um, but yeah, what, but it's, I haven't had any attacks so far. Um, it's, it's been mostly, mostly good, good responses. Um, and it feels so good to have the freedom to just share, you know, it's one of those things where I don't know who's going to see it. I don't know what, and I know that it's, you know, you don't know who your audience is going to be like this podcast. I have no idea who's going to hear it, if anyone. Um, but I know that it's out of my control. It's out of my control who sees it and it's out of my control the effect it has. But I know that the Lord can do amazing things. Um, it's kind of like when I when I prayed at the, you know, the um, the dining center in college, you know, when I after I became Catholic, I wanted to make the sign of the cross and pray before before meals. And I was so terrified. I was so embarrassed. I was just like, but then I realized the only people who are going to see me are the ones that God wants to see me. Otherwise, if he doesn't want anyone to see me, they're not going to see me. They're going to be looking at their food or whatever. So I'm like, I may as well just do it because it's, it's, it's God's choice who sees me and who doesn't see me. So whatever, I'll just do it. So it's kind of the same thing, but just a lot of self-doubt. And um, I don't know what I fear more, persecution from non-Catholics or persecution from Catholics. I mean, because I <laughs> I mean, there's both. Either one is very likely, just as likely, you know, I, I don't uh, I don't. Yeah. Anyway, hmm. but I guess I'm doing it. I'm hoping that it'll reach the the little ones, the the ones who need encouragement, the ones who are humble and little and and open to, um, you know, like I said, I'm not out to try to, to argue with people or anything. And I even thought about that. Like, what if someone comes back at me with like an argument? I just, I'm not there to argue. Like, I'm just there to share. I'm there to share. I'm not going to argue or try to convince anyone. <laughs> I'm just going to share, mm. you know, and it feels good. Mm. It feels yeah, strange. Feel oh, please. Oh, I was just going to say, like, I mean, I've been trying to remember, like, what, what even inspired this? I've been trying to remember. And I just, I still, I still just have to attribute it to Nat's dad dying. Mm. I, I, he was a very holy man. And by holy, I mean, uh, you know what I said was holy just like he walked with God he he was he was just a very he he was he had a very strong faith and um and and he inspired a lot of people with his life and and I just think after he died he just has been pouring lots of graces on us like mm -hmm. <laughs> opening up so many things for us in fact I wouldn't be surprised if he had a hand and or Nat shared the other night that you know, his dad would be really proud of him with this fellowship thing. Mm -hmm. And I, and I said, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if he had a hand in it. Uh, but yeah, it was all around the same time that I started. Yeah. I just think that a lot of graces have been flowing after his death for, for us and for a lot of people. So, um, yeah, cause the fear was gone. Like it was gone. I mean, no, I was still nervous. I mean, I mean it wasn't, it wasn't gone, but like the blockage and the mm -hmm. doubt and I just had more grace to, to do it. So. Mm -hmm. hmm. It feels strange to ask this question, but um, uh, insofar, well, the question is, is there anything that you've shared that you've written that you've published on Twitter that you feel proud of? And as you said, you know, God gives us the strength to do these things and it's through God mm -hmm. and, you know, not, not that you yourself created it perhaps, but something that you feel like, oh, that was uh, something that meant something to me that I shared and uh, that you mm -hmm. feel good that it's out there. Hmm. 
pretty much anything I share about Mary, mm. actually. Like, yeah, I recently started a sub stack because because sometimes like in the morning I I write pages like I I journal and just to get things out and sometimes it turns into something like this conversation with God that is very like whoa I start having all these insights and stuff I'm like I gotta share this so I I this is more than just a journal right now this is like something I need to write and mm -hmm. share but like it's too long for a Twitter thread it's way too long so so I wrote my first sub stack the other day. I forget what it was about. Lent. Something about Lent. Hmm. Anyway, probably about love and mercy or something. Uh <laughs> oh no, Lent is a season of joy. That's a, oh my goodness. Talk about contradictions. Like, wait, what? Um, but yeah, anything I can do or say to honor Mary uh is is I'm gonna feel just so good about um because i there's something called total wait true devotion no true devotion to mary is the book name but it's a total consecration to mary um and it's basically it's basically or the the language he uses in the book is offering yourself to her as her slave basically like i surrender any claim i have to myself or to my possessions, or to my even my soul, like everything. I just, I just, a total act of love and trust in Mary, which is, uh, which is basically just imitating, imitating what God did. Hmm. He, he gave his himself to her. He gave his son to her, um, and everything. Anyway, yeah. So reading, reading that book was very pivotal, and, and giving myself to Mary and my life and my spirituality has been totally different since then. And all that strength and self-discipline and everything, she had me get rid of that right away. It was like, mm -hmm. nope, no more. Boop. Um, and just lean on her and trust her instead of trusting my own strength or understanding or will. Uh, and just knowing that she will lead me. that was another interior vision like this vision of mary standing at the top of a mountain this treacherous looking super treacherous looking mountain and she's standing at the top with jesus in the eucharist and you know a monstrance right next to her and hearing her her voice saying don't try to climb the mountain it's too dangerous just stay in the valley and i'll bring you up the mountain when it's time so that was another vision that really stayed with me. But so I've been in the valley. I'm in the valley and just trusting her to bring me up when when it's time. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was another crazy time. There was another crazy time that um I was praying in the chapel and thinking about how much I want to go to heaven and 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 Jesus <laughs> and Jesus was like, I could bring you right now if you want. <laughs> I was like, Wait, what? What? No. Um. Uh. Well, maybe not yet. <laughs> it was like just calling me out, basically. Just like, oh, really? Well, I can bring you right now. It's no problem. It's no uh -huh. big deal, right? It's no big deal, right? <laughs> oh. oh my gosh! Yeah, he he knows me. He knows me very very well. Hmm. Mm. Just don't know myself very well. Mm. So he, but he's been showing me. Oh yeah. So anything I can say about Mary, it's good. I'm her girl. <laughs> well, I'd love to ask you about your family and Nat and your kids and unschooling and things like this. And, um, you know, I think, um, uh, yeah, I'd love to start by asking about Nat because you know, it's nice because I had him on the podcast as well. And now if you on, and there's sort of, you can re refract uh each other's characters and i'm i'm curious to hear you describe him and and what drew you to him and what you admire about him hmm. well i mean what what drew me to him was i i mean initially he was very attractive of course he's this tall attractive 
intelligent guy, which obviously I would be attracted to, but what, and creative and, and powerful, all these things that I'm very attracted to. Um, but what really won me over was his heart. I saw him like he, his older, his, his Nana was in community too, like his grandma. And every now and then I'd be walking down the hall and he'd be in there talking to her. And I'm like, he's just in there visiting his grandmother. Like, how can you not love a man who visits his grandmother? You know, (laughs) and, and also the way he played with kids. That's another thing. Like, how can you not love a man who plays with kids? I, these, this one family in particular, they'd come visit and they have these, they have like 13 kids now, but, but they're, and they're all super wild and crazy. They're just crazy, crazy kids, uh, totally unblocked, love them. And now it would be just crazy with them, like wrestling them and rolling around and doing crazy stuff. And, and when we play volleyball, he'd have these crazy war, cra- his, his willingness to look foolish that also drew me to him because usually I see these tall, dark, handsome, intelligent men, and they're all about their maintaining their self image or taking themselves very seriously. Mm -hmm. But he was just wacko. (laughs) And I'm glad, I'm so glad that other people get to appreciate that about him now because of his TikTok videos or whatever. He's becoming more the man that I fell in love with again, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, which he always has been. He just has been under this burden for a long time, uh, having to be professional and et cetera. But, uh, but yeah, he's just kind of wacko and and willing to have fun and look foolish. And he has an amazing, kind heart. Loving, loving, kind heart. Which is, if you get to witness it, it's beautiful. Um so those are the two things. So there's the tall, dark, handsome, witty, creative thing that attracted to me him to me uh, me to him initially. But why I married him, why I became his friend, like such a good friend, was probably the wackiness, and why I married him was the heart, hmm. um, loving, loyal, kind heart. Um, so that answers does that answer your question? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it does. Yes. <laughs> Um, as a follow-up question, I'm curious how to put this. One of the things I've admired about Nat is his sort of discomfort challenges. And we talked about that on the podcast. And, um, I'm Mm -hmm. curious what sense you make of that, of like the things that have been hard for Nat and his process of like challenging himself, pushing himself past his comfort zone. Like what sense do you make Mm -hmm. of that? And what do you see him going through as he's, uh, developed over the years? Hmm. Yeah. Um, in a certain sense, he, even though I said he's willing to look foolish, uh, only in select audio, only at home mm. previously, you know, like, so when he was acting like that, we were at community, he was comfortable there, uh, friends and family, etc. cetera. Um, but going out into the world, I, I mean, but otherwise, like with strangers, very introverted, very insecure um very uh, afraid to look foolish afraid to um yeah and and taking himself very seriously like his self image his hair had to be perfect he had to, he thought of himself as like this serious artiste and i always poked fun at him for that because he took himself too seriously um and and so the discomfort challenges um in a certain sense it's like making the world i guess you could say making the world his home more i've never thought of it that way but yeah it's like he's not in community anymore he's not around his friends and family and community his comfort zone there um so it's like expanding his comfort zone by making the world his home and making strangers his family and friends um so yeah that's probably given him the freedom to to be the wacky guy again or be the to to look foolish again is 
it's really, so his discomfort challenges were really just a desire to be himself again. You know, in that sense, it's like fear. I'm living in this constant fear all the time as preventing me from being just who I am. And so how can I get over this? <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I guess that's, I, yeah, thanks for asking that question. I've never really thought into it very deeply, but yeah, I guess that that is. I'm very proud of him for it. Very, very proud of him for, for doing that. Um, Cause a lot of people wouldn't, would, would just become more and more shut down. You know, I think that's more the pattern It's just become more and more shut down um, and maybe blame others for oppressing you as opposed to finding a way to, to break free, mm. you know, in that way, or acknowledging that you are only a prisoner in your own mind you know, that you're keeping yourself down and oppressing yourself. Um, and it really isn't anyone else. And it was like an experiment too. Like, cause it was a social experiment. Like, is it really other people who are ke keeping me down? So like do these things that he was afraid that other people would keep him down. And it turns out they didn't, mm. it was just him keeping himself down. Mm. Um, and in a certain sense, that's same with me, like writing about the faith, right? Who is keeping me down? It was just me, my mm. fear. Um, so I guess that's my discomfort challenge. <laughs> yeah. You seem to me to be someone who loves children and maybe, I mean, I, 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 I'm offering this reflection so you can correct it if you disagree, but seems like someone who like wanted to have kids and uh, like loves having kids and uh, you love your children. And I think you're a wonderful mom. And um, I'm curious how you feel about children and, and why have children and why you wanted to have children and what, what the role of your children in your life has been like. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed being a child. I never really thought about having kids like a lot of a lot of mom, like my mom she she knew early on that she wanted to be a mom like and that's probably why being a hard, mom was so hard for her because mm -hmm. <laughs> she had imagined it so much and read all the books and had all these ideals in her mind and it was like a disappointment she disappointed herself mm -hmm. for not being the mom she imagined right but I never imagined being a mom I never I was never a baby person or thought about have, getting married and having kids I um, never thought about that stuff. Uh, I thought about being like a ninja warrior. I took karate and stuff. And that, that's what I dreamed about was being a ninja turtle or something. I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think about being a mom. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So in other words, I enjoyed being a kid and I wanted mm -hmm. to continue being a kid. Um, and so I did get along with kids very well because I was very childlike myself and I loved playing with them and they loved me for that reason too but I was never responsible for them. I I was never like a teacher or a babysitter or anything like that. So when I saw kids, I played with them and talked to them, but I was never in charge of them. Um, and Nat and I were both the youngest children. So we, and we were both very intuitive, like in our minds. So not very hands-on and practical. So we're, we were, we're joking about it. Like, it'll be a miracle if any of our kids survive. Like, we're just gonna, <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just be doing our projects and thinking about stuff and forget to feed them or something, you know? Like, it's gonna be a miracle. Like, so we're doing good. None of uh -huh. our kids, all of our kids have survived so far. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, in terms of having my, my own kids, like, of course I thought I was gonna be a nun, you know? So I didn't think even as an adult that, um, but I did remember reflecting, contemplating motherhood when I was in the monastery, uh, even before joining the monastery, and how heroic it is. Mothers are the most unsung heroes in the whole world. The lives of sacrifice and just pouring themselves out completely all the time. Like, like nuns wake up in the middle of the night to pray the op midnight office, and they, they pray their... They, Throughout the day, they're interrupted by the bells and they have to drop everything to go to, to prayer, et cetera. M moms get interrupted all the time. They wake up in the middle of the night to, 
I mean, this has been my monastery. This is my monastery. And the kids are where I'm I'm loving and pouring myself out. And serving them is my prayer. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, I actually did get a word in the monastery, which is very confusing to me. Because this was before I started even thinking about leaving. This was when I was super happy to be there, etc. And the Lord said, I want to have children by you. I'm like, oh, he must mean spiritual children. (laughs) Like, that must be what he means. Okay, yeah, let's have lots of spiritual children. That sounds good. I was like, no, I'm pretty sure he meant literally um, in retrospect. But uh, so, and he even asked me, like, what would you do if you knew that all your kids would be saints? And my answer is, I would have, I would have tons of kids. You know, I would just, I would just have lots of kids, because that's the main fear is just that they're, they're not gonna be happy. They're not gonna turn out. They're gonna. You don't know how their, what their life's gonna be like, what their journey's gonna be. It's totally out of your control, um. But. But yeah, and, and the stress, especially like, uh, as a, as a Catholic mother, the stress and the pressure to like hand on the faith and like, make sure they know everything I know and make sure this and that, the other thing. And especially like as an unschooling parent, it's like, how in the world do you unschool the faith? You know, I mean, it's very schooled. Like the way the Catholic church is set up, it's just like school. There's a curriculum and there's tests and there's right and wrong answers. And all, it's just like, it's so schooled. No wonder people grow up hating it. People who were raised in the Catholic church end up hating it or hating themselves. Like those are the two things. Um, unless they they go through like a reversion as an adult, which happened to some friends in college too. But, uh, but it's the same thing like with math. Like people end up hating math because they were forced to learn it you know um so i don't want to do that with the faith i want them to love it the way i love it and the way for them to do that is not to force it um but so i'm like trying to meet like the requirements uh but like bare minimum like Mm. (laughs) like okay guys you know the church you know the the parish has this rule that if you want to receive communion you need to go to the special class so so you know uh so we we can do it but you know it's just kind of one of those things um and it's the same with anything like if there's government requirements for things and stuff too like okay well the government says we have to do this so i guess i guess we'll do it but you know it's just a not not make it a moral thing you know um uh and not make it like a, you're going to do this because I said so kind of thing too. A lot of parents do that instead of just communicating like, well, you know, we live in America and this is the requirements of the government. So I guess we got to, we can do it. And if we don't do it, this might be a consequence. But if we really don't want to do it, we can, we can risk it. Or, yeah. you know, that's another thing is it's just like, say like, you don't have to follow this rule, but this might be the consequence. So you choose what what we can choose whether to risk it or not. Um, oh my goodness. What was your question? I am all over the place talking about kids, talking about having kids. Why did I want to have kids? Uh, and Nat and I, of course, when we were in community, we were all about having kids because we were in community and Nat, Nat grew up in community and he knew it was wonderful to grow up as a child in community. Um, and we felt very taken care of and that we had a, a village, you know, it takes a village. So we were all about having lots of kids. Um, and since leaving, I mean, we, I mean, it's been harder on our own and it's hard for everyone because there's no village, you know, it's super hard. Mm-hmm. Uh, even having one child is super hard. Uh, and yeah, so, so now we're in, in the midst of the world that everyone else is living in. And I can identify, I can identify the problem points and I want it. I want it to be an easy and joyful thing to have children, you know, 
And I, I don't judge anyone who doesn't want to have kids because it is terribly difficult in this, in the way it's set up right now. It's terribly difficult. Um, but I just think it's sad, you know, I just think it's sad that it's so hard because it's not supposed to be, I mean, it is hard, but you're supposed to have the support and the encouragement of a whole community to raise children. Uh, you're not supposed to have to do it on your own like this. Um, so, so yeah, it's hard, but it's, it's been worth it. I mean, our kids are amazing. Um, but we have had to bear a lot of, uh, a lot of things uh we've had to bear a lot of loneliness uh and isolation we've had to find very creative ways to live the kind of life we want to live because it's not easy um yeah it's it's, it's hard but they're awesome people so that's the thing is I just see kids as awesome people. We have our own little community. Like we, we, I keep looking for a community to join, but I just, we just made one. We're just like, here they are. <laughs> I mean, it's still pretty small. It's, it's small. Um, but, and we'd, we'd like it to be bigger, but yeah, here we are. Um, anyway. Hmm. What contributed to your and Nat's decision to unschool your children? Okay, so so Nat was homeschooled. He was kind of homeschool co-op because all the families and community were homeschooled together. Um, and then I, of course, uh, decided to homeschool when I was older. Um, so I, we both knew that we wanted to homeschool. And there were a lot of homeschool families we knew in North Dakota. Um, and so that was kind of my ideal from the beginning, even going into it. And Nat, too, we we we're not down with the public school thing um uh for two reasons the the meanness of the kids and also just how it would just dominate our lives mm -hmm. like we would be we would be on the school schedule on the t i just saw homework and activities and early mornings dropping the kids off and i just i just saw it dominating our lives um so yeah two reasons we didn't want to go public school um, so when, when our oldest was getting up to school age, I started researching all the different approaches we could take, you know, um, so I was looking at Montessori and, um, uh, reading a lot of Montessori and Charlotte Mason, um, and different educators like this to try to find something that was a little less schoolish. Cause that's another thing is I looked at all the other homeschool families and they were all busy and stressed out. Like there was no difference between them and the public schoolers. They were stressed out and busy all the time. Like what is going on here, peoples? <laughs> um, so I was trying to find a different kind of curriculum that would be a little more relaxed. So I was going to go with like Charlotte Mason or something, which emphasizes just reading good books and being outside a lot. I'm like, that sounds good, you know? Um, and all these different educators writing about trusting the child and their innate their innate uh curiosity and wanting to learn through life and exploration etc uh and so I found like a Charlotte Mason curriculum I'm like yeah now I think I might order this and and I don't know where he heard of it but he but he said have you ever heard of unschooling I'm like no so I looked it up right there this article how do unschoolers turn out and that's what we want, right? Like, I don't want to know what the theory is. I want to know how they actually turn out. So I read that article. I'm like, is, can this be real? Is this like, what? And it was a perfect fit for us because it was basically just continuing to do what we were already doing, which is learning from life. You know, um, it's like Montessori, except all the way up to adulthood, <laughs> like just exploring and learning and following your interests and looking into stuff and being exposed to things and um, just living life. And uh, yeah, so it seemed kind of too good to be true, but I read more and we were trying it out and kind of our approach to life or anything we try to do is so far so good. 
you know, we hold it lightly. We don't like commit to, we are going to do this thick or thin, you know, it's like so far so good. We're going to try it. And as long as it's so far so good, we'll keep doing it. And if not, then we'll try something else. Um, it's no big deal, right? <laughs> um, and yeah, so that was our decision to unschool. Cause I, cause I pictured like having a curriculum and like forcing the kids to sit there and do workbooks when they don't want to do it. And I don't want to do it. And there's a sunshiny day outside. And why are we doing this? Um, so I didn't want to do that. Um, and so far so good. They, they are learning so much and they're growing up very independent. Like they know how to learn things on their own, but they ask us for help if they need it. Um, and we feel more like we're learning alongside them. Like we all get to share our interests with each other. Um, and, uh, and it's very adaptable. Like we don't need a lot of supplies. We don't need a lot of activities, expensive activities that you got to drive the kids to, you know, just, ah, we're doing that a little bit more now just because we're stationary and there's a karate dojo down the road. And I, I always thought maybe the kids want to do karate. Um, but yeah, we want to stay flexible and not be tied to, to, I don't like being tied down. Have you noticed this? Like it was kind of insane for me to enter a monastery. I just did not know myself very much. <laughs> I did not know myself very well. Like it was insane for me. To, and I that's when the panic started to set in was when, see, I thought I was gonna die. See, I thought I was gonna receive the habit and and just die in an ecstasy and go to heaven. Like I did not think I was gonna be there very long. But you know what? <laughs> I received the habit and it didn't happen. I didn't die in an ecstasy. And then I looked at this sister who was celebrating her 60th Jubilee. And I'm like, I could be here for 60 years. Ah, get me out of here, you know. Um, mm. Which, you know, is a good sign. Marrying Nat was the opposite. Like I thought about, I could be married to Nat for 60 years. And that made me happy, you know. So that's a good sign. Mm -hmm. Um I'm excited to grow old with Nat. It's just going to get better and better. Um, but yeah, I was not like that with the monastery. I was basically, I didn't even realize I was just gritting my teeth until I died at a young age. You know? <laughs> um, anyway, I'm going on a tangent again. What was your question? <laughs> I was asking about the unschooling. I, you know, oh, as right, you said that right. just now, I was, I got an impression of, uh, I was imagining God when you decided to join the monastery, be like, okay, Martha, you can join the monastery if you want exactly. to. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. He is the ultimate unschooling father. This is <laughs> how he's treated me all this time. He's an unschooling father. He doesn't like, yep. He's just like, follow your interests. Go follow your interests. Go do it. See what mm. happens. Mm. And he's there with me, keeping me safe the whole time. See, that's the thing is that, and that's what we're being to our kids. We're like, we're there with them. We're keeping them, we're providing a safe environment for them to learn so they don't have to be afraid. Fear squishes learning. You can't learn if you're afraid. You know, you want to shut yourself in a little box and protect yourself. But if you feel safe, you can explore and learn all sorts of things, you know? So yeah, he's the ultimate unschooling father for me. That's why I, I he surprised me so much because I expect him to be this disciplinarian, you know, like study hard and pass the test kind of father and he's just not so mm. um not for me anyway see that's the thing i'm generalizing but like he could be a different kind of father to everyone you know he's exactly what he he knows us each so deeply that he can it's just like a father knowing each of their children different they're, they're all each child is totally different you can't treat them all the same you know um so yeah anyway mm. mm -hmm. I had the, you know, real pleasure of being with you all for a little while at the end of last year. And um, I've been thinking a lot about that stay. I mean, I, I learn a lot from everyone that I live with for a time, but, you know, I think that stay has definitely stuck with me and I've thought a lot about it. And um, in fact, I've thought a lot about it with um, 
what I call the curiosity department. There's like three parts of my work and there's the love department, the curiosity department and the power mm -hmm. department. And I feel mm -hmm. like uh, being with you all was a, a real education in the, what the curiosity department uh, values are and what it could look like and what I care about. And I'm wondering um, if you could say a little bit about for someone who who hasn't had the privilege of coming to visit you what sort of a, a day in the life is like at your house or in your family and like what you know it doesn't have to be an hour by hour although that would be fine but more like mm -hmm. what's the vibe and what's what's happening there exactly like could you describe to someone who hasn't been there what's what what's unusual that you know they might notice like oh that's different uh because mm -hmm. it is different and you know I mean every, every family and house and situation is different but um I'm curious if you could say something about that and what someone might notice if they came to visit yeah I it's like you said it's it's hard to know because I'm it's just normal for mm -hmm. us you know but I do notice like when I when I visit someone else's house or when when other kids come visit us other kids come visit us and they're like pestering me the whole time like oh Mrs. Sharp Mrs. Sharp can I do this can I do this can I do this I'm like what you asking me for <laughs> like what, what the heck <laughs> go do do whatever uh -huh. little child you know <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that's, that's the thing with with Nat and I is we just we we, we enable the kids to just do their own thing you know even like feeding themselves like they early on I was just like I do not want to feed these kids all the time they have to learn how to feed themselves you know <laughs> um so they'll just and we don't have regular meal times like they'll just randomly when they're hungry they get something to eat and then we just ask that they clean up after themselves so they go get their own food they clean up after themselves random times during the day whenever they're hungry and the adults do the exact same thing we, we're basically all doing the exact same thing mm -hmm. we're just like a whole bunch of adults living in a house is what it's like Mm -hmm. um yeah we're all just a bunch of adults that's, that's what it's like and it works for the record it works uh, the kids <laughs> do eat <laughs> they very eat strange hours even very strange hours sometimes very sometimes they just eat cereal all day that's what <laughs> that's i did as a kid too and like cereal is great um and uh yeah and then screens pretty much unlimited once again just like adults right so nat and i have unlimited screens the kids have unlimited screens it's like adults we see ourselves as big kids and them as little adults mm. but then just like me i get tired of screens and i want to go dance play in the sunshine i go outside i'm just like woo who wants to go for a walk let's go we and oh i'm gonna go out in the backyard anyone want to come etc um and the kids do the same thing like it, our son loves to game and he loves to watch youtube but then Every now and then he like comes up with this crazy experiment he wants to do based on a YouTube video he saw, or he comes out to share like this joke or meme that he saw, or he just says, who wants to go on the trampoline? And they all go on the trampoline. And um, yeah, so it's just like this, we're all independent operators kind of living under the same roof. Um, uh, yeah, and you know, life has changed now because I used to work full time at my coding job, but it was still remote, you know. Um, but yeah, Nat takes care of Melody a lot, uh, uh, the baby, the baby a lot. Um, and he does just fine with it. He does better with it than I do because he's he's fine just being on his phone and I want to actually go out around doing things. So I get much more restless with when I'm with her. But um, but the kids like to be with her, too. Like the kids are like, oh, can I play with her? And oh, can I put her to sleep? I'm like, sure, here you go. <laughs> like, yeah, take the baby. <laughs> and love she just loves it. She's like the most loved, most entertained baby in the world. Just like, here, yeah, play with her. Put her to sleep. It's great. Um, and we pay the kids. We don't expect them to do chores. We expect them to clean up after themselves. Like if they get food, just clean up after yourself like that's just a courtesy thing but in terms of extraneous chores like um the dishwasher or sweeping the floors or different things like that I just kind of take it as my responsibility I we kind of see them as guests in our home hmm. in a certain sense just like when you were visiting us we didn't expect you to 
to empty the dishwasher in the morning or something, <laughs> you know, um, we just expected you to clean up after yourself if you made a mess. Um, yeah. And uh, we kind of do the same for the kids. But if they ask for a job or we can hire them to do jobs just like adults, right? So yeah, empty the dishwasher or running the dishwasher has been a job or like the kids, like Abraham has taken Melody for like two hours. Like, do you want to babysit Mel? Actually babysitting her, not just playing with her for two hours, $10, you know? So, I mean, it's kind of cheap in terms of babysitting, but it's also, he's, we're not leaving the house, you know? Uh, and he could still bring her to us if he needed to. Um, if we can eventually, if we can leave the house, the price is going to go up. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. you're a real babysitter now. Um, mm -hmm. But, but yeah, so we hire them and that means that they're independent financially a lot too. So they can use their money to buy whatever they want. We don't really restrict it. They can buy candy. They can buy, actually Abraham just bought his first, uh, not an iPhone, uh, Android phone. He's been wanting a phone for a while and that's very expensive one. I, I mean, it's more expensive than candy. Let's put it that way. So I said we would pay for half, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yesterday he handed me $80. Here you go from all his jobs he'd done. And, and they feel they don't beg us for things. You know, this is the thing with other kids. They're like, can I have this? Can I do this? Can I bit a bit of it? It's like, they have to come to the adults for every permission for every mm -hmm. little thing. Like, no, we go out to a store. They're not begging us to buy them stuff. Like, did you bring your, your wallet? Like, oh, I'm going to get this. Okay, go mm -hmm. buy it. Like, they don't have to ask us permission. It's their money. Um, so yeah, we, we treat them like adults as much as we can, you know? And they, and uh, yeah, I guess it is kind of different. It's definitely working for us though. I'm remembering uh, one of the, there, there are many things that were noticeable about being there, but one of them was uh, that I'm remembering just now is, you know, I've, do, I've done a lot of work in the last few years on my boundaries and I wrote like a blog post about it, what I learned from our friend Jane about boundaries and stuff. She really taught me a lot. And um, it was so nice because as I say, there are many things I noticed, but one of them was that I'm remembering now is like the kids would come up to me and be like, hey, can I show you something? And I like generally loved interacting with them. And, and then sometimes I'd be like tired or I had something to do or, you know, I had Zoom calls or something. I'd be like, actually, I'm busy right now. And they're like, oh, OK, cool. <laughs> and it was just like it was just like interacting with a respectful adult. Just naturally, it was like, they were like oh, like I'd love to show you something. And I'm like, actually, now is not a good time for like, Oh, fine. No problem. It was just like super smooth and super easy. It was like they didn't feel no whining they didn't shame me or something they were like oh please Dashin. you know and then later on they'd be like hey can you play now and be like yes i'd love to <laughs> it was great uh and i felt like that from you too too as well it's just like everyone was like hey we're happy to have you here and if you want to interact with us great and if you don't no problem like just yeah clean up after yourself don't make a mess and you're good <laughs> you know uh, it was really i think um really lovely and um yeah, I think also just they 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 really um how to put it. Yeah, I think I think the adults that I admire really have this sense of autonomy and um knowing what they're interested in, what they care about, and then pursuing that and you know, going for it. And uh they all have that as well. And it really shined through how that's I think that's that's the natural sort of state for kids is just to be curious and open and really for human nature, it's you know, alive and curious and autonomous and you know, caring and loving and respectful to each other. And I feel like the container that you all are creating for your children is is one that's just, yeah. I mean, I don't know if they'll all be saints or not, because we'll have to see what the Catholic Church says about that in a, a few hundred years. But uh, I can see they're becoming, you know, really beautiful humans that are just alive and vibrant and curious and intelligent and, you know, respectful. And, um, you know, I'm I'm curious to see who they end up becoming. So, yeah, thank you. Really, thank you. Thank you. Um, how to put this? I feel almost not that I can speak for the world, but there's something of on behalf of the world. I'm like, wow, you've brought some really beautiful humans into the world. And uh, it was a it was a pleasure to meet them. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I we definitely love having we loved having you. We loved having I mean, there have been various people who've been able to stay with us. And it just is such a gift to be able to share our lives with 
with others for even a brief time. It is really awesome. And, and it makes us feel really good when people tell us how awesome our kids are too. <laughs> of course, just getting that affirmation. Cause we don't get it everywhere, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, like, especially in situations where it is more authoritarian, you know, uh, my, our oldest is always, whenever she goes into situations outside the house, there's always, she always gets a little grumpy and I'm like, Oh, what's wrong. And she says, I don't like being treated like a kid. Mm. Mm-hmm. And it's just inevitable. Like mm. you treat pe- most people treat kids like kids mm-hmm. <laughs> and most kids are used to being treated like kids too. Um, so there's a friction there when we go out and about with the kids uh, judgment from others, because they're not just instantly obedient they see that they can see them as like talking back they're not like talking back they're just talking to you like an adult they're talking to you like an equal Uh you know they're talking to you like an equal but anyone who doesn't see them as an equal would see that as as giving them lip or whatever Mm -hmm. um anyway but yeah so it's wonderful Mm -hmm. wonderful to have affirmation Mm -hmm. (laughs) um from people that we respect too, you know? Um, so yeah, thank you for coming to join our life for a few weeks. That was wonderful. Mm. That's reminding me of another interaction that um, was really sweet for me, which was you know, what you're saying about like, oh, do, they don't talk back. You know, they're just like asking questions or saying what they think or something. And I remember um, I I mentioned, you know, cause I use this language friends from the Quakers, right? I'll call everyone mm-hmm. friend. And at one point, I forget how it came up, but I referred to, I think, trees as our friends. I just said, oh, I think trees are our friends. And one of your daughters was like, what do you mean? They're not, they're just trees, you know? Um, and, you know, it's a pretty common opinion for people. And I, like, thought about that. Like, how, uh, hmm, how do I, what do I say here? And then I sort of, like, came back a day later and I was like, you know, we were talking about this. And your daughter was like, yep, yep. Uh, and I was like, well, here's how I see it, which is, you know, people... Oh, I said that they're people. I said that they're people and that they're our friends. And I said, well, pe-, she's like, well, they're not people, you know? Um, and I said, well, yes, they're not humans. That's that's true, obviously, correct. And um, also what I mean is we treat other people with respect and love and care and we consider what their needs are and they have uh, individuality and, and their own needs and their own preferences and and things that we do to take care of them. And we take that for granted with people. And so what I'm saying is trees and plants and animals are worthy of the same respect, which I, you know, in the earth itself, I feel very strongly about. And and I, I said that to her and she was like, oh, okay, great. Like they're people. <laughs> I was, and I, I, she's just like, well, that's how I see it. And I, I, you know, I wasn't trying to convince her or something, but it felt, since she asked, it was like, well, what do you mean? You know, it felt important to say. And then she's like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. Like, yeah, they're not humans. I'm right. They're not humans. And they're, they're worthy of love and respect. Uh, so yep. That was a really beautiful, beautiful interaction. And um, it really speaks to this um, kind of, yeah. And again, that, that was so nice to see. Like, it's not just, a, I really believe this, but it's just, it's not that in one sense, you're creating special kids, right? They're, they're, they're unique to themselves. There's only, you know, one of each of them. And on the other hand, that's just, that's just human nature. And the nature of being alive is to be vibrant and curious and, you know, full and, and then you're not putting that down. So, it, and that's, that is rare, you know, because a lot of the structures do sort of block that in and create all these problems and so on. So you're just not doing that. <laughs> and then they can <laughs> blossom as who they are, which is unique mm-hmm. in that they're individuals, but then also not rare in terms of it's just our nature, I think, to be that way. Yeah. And that just the way you describe like each of them are so unique. It's like that's what makes it so hard to stop having kids. Like, <laughs> like who else could come out? Who who else could we meet? Uh-huh. Like we I I mean, on the one hand, we're like, oh my gosh, don't want any more kids. But on the other hand, it's like, but we'd be missing out. If you're missing out, who else, who else would we bring into the world? Mm. These amazing people. Uh, so, so anyway, we'll see, we'll see, see. but, um, but yeah, that's, and, and that's, that's another thing is like, not, we haven't been overprotective of, of the kids, you know? And in that sense, it's been really actually helpful. I can see how it's been very helpful that Nat, uh, took the direction that he did, um, 
even though it's been hard and painful on the one hand. On the other hand, I could see how we could be totally trapped in to that little world of Catholic homeschooling families and our worldview much smaller. Um, and uh, I, I see that it has been a gift to have to. Um... So, for example, I could have I could have been. I mean, you you came to visit us during during Christmas time, and mm. I know you're not you're, you're not Christian. So I'm like, well, what's this? I don't know what's this going to be like, you know. Mm. Um, but I'm like, whatever, you know. Uh -huh. I mean, if I was an overprotective Catholic mom, I'd be like, no, we blah blah whatever. Oh, who knows what ideas that he'll plant in their heads or whatever. I'm just like, whatever. It's not going to be any worse than their own father, you know. <laughs> oh boy. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, anyway and and they are individual thinkers you know mm. they think very deeply about things they ask questions they're they're thoughtful and it's respecting them uh, uh intellectually as well like they're not just these blank slates that we have to write on they actually have their own ideas their own thoughts they figure things out they understand things um and yeah don't have to overprotect them from things i mean watching youtube i have no idea i have no idea what ideas they're coming across watching youtube we don't restrict it uh and they come and because we don't restrict it they are so open sharing with us too mm. there's that trust and openness they can share whatever they watch on youtube they can share with us they feel like they can because mm -hmm. we're not going to be like don't watch that show you know um mm. so that's that's another thing is and and anyway, your answer about the trees and stuff. I mean, you strike me as being very, very a lot like like Saint Francis of Assisi, right? You even dress like you you got the and you're an itinerant. You're uh -huh. itinerant like you uh, you you just need to be barefoot. The barefoot friars, right? I'd love uh, to be if I could manage it. I would love to be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, but he was always calling everything in creation his brothers and sisters, right? I mean, because we have the same father. Um, so even though, even though like the, the theologians would come and be like making all the distinctions and, and stuff, but it's just a very simple, like, of course, he's the father of all of us. So we're, we're brothers and sisters. So, mm. you know, um, mm. yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with my daughter, whichever one it was. Mm. Uh. <laughs> very happily. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you've been very kind in answering all my questions. I'm uh, just want to sort of open it up into anything that you'd like to talk about or ask, or you know, we can converse if you like, or end here, whatever you would like now. Okay, yeah, I think probably the <laughs> the funniest thing I shared with <laughs> was the going to the strip club uh -huh. thing. I don't know if I ever shared that with someone before. I don't know how Nat will feel about that either. <laughs> But he was the one who wrote those questions that that you That's didn't. That's right. Ask. He sent some very, very interesting <laughs> questions. Yep. Yeah, it's it's good. Um, this has been a very wonderful conversation. I I don't think we. Uh, yeah, whatever whatever we said is is what we needed to say. I don't know. It's just like it was. There's no way to tell the whole story or to cover everything and two hours um i didn't ask you why why you left the monastery or, mm. or anything as well but but you were interviewing me i suppose i suppose you've written about it elsewhere hmm. i really haven't i don't know um if, if you wanted to you're welcome to or we could close there I mean, mm. anything's fine yeah yeah you, you don't really have to tell me it's mm. one of those things where i just i'm more interested in what you're doing now mm. you know yeah. i mean people uh yeah, the past is important. Like it's 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 been our journey up to this point and we really are the same person in a lot of ways. But what really is important is what what we're doing now and going forward. So hmm. I mean, people yeah, like saying, "Oh, none none to bartender or whatever." Like that's the opposite. I'm like, "No, I was the same person. I was making the same decisions for the same reasons mm -hmm. that I'm doing right now." It was like the same same person um so it's really about knowing the person not just the outward yeah even the outward actions don't even necessarily say what is going on in the inside too so mm -hmm.
I couldn't agree more. I think it's like that story about you going from being a nun to a bartender. It's like, yeah, that, I mean, I didn't expect that. I didn't know about that. It was one of the joys of this is to like know the backstory, sort of like, ooh, spicy. Or, or the strip club days. Like, oh, I didn't know about that. It makes total sense, though. <laughs> Fits with everything I know. That one surprised me less than the bartender one, actually. Uh, but um, but like, but people are real, right? Mm, people mm-hmm. are real. And so um, real people are complex and Mm -hmm. uh Mm -hmm. vast and endless and not not you can make a prediction and it might even be right but the truth is far more complex than any thought we can have about it and so um it's like yeah of course you went and i didn't know that but oh oh, it makes sense uh when became a bartender (laughs) okay (laughs) now i know this fact about the universe that is true that is real like a real person joined a monastery and left and became a bartender that is real (laughs) you know uh yeah yeah it's so funny when i went to the bartending school i went in and talked to the the person uh in the office and she she likes to ask people like what's their background and why are they coming there you know (laughs) and i'm like oh you had a good answer for her yeah, well, she left up. I I said, well, okay. I I just I just left a monastery, and she's like, what? And she leaps out of her chair and goes and slams her office door. And she's like, tell me everything. <laughs> and I started describing it to her. And she's like, this sounds just like an experience that I had before coming here, except very different at the same time because she had been to prison. <laughs> mm. I'm like. Yeah, it was, it, I mean, the the main difference is that I was there willingly, you know, I mean, and everyone else was there willingly too. So that's the main difference. But otherwise, just being stuck in a small space with the same people um, is, is, it's the, uh, the pressure cooker. Yeah. <laughs> it's what the nuns called it. It's a pressure cooker. It's going to stir things up and bring things to the surface and put you under this pressure that you have never been under before. Um, so I suppose in a certain sense, I've been running from that, uh, that, that painful experience. Uh, so even though I have this desire for community still, and Nat does too, shh, he, he won't admit it, but, <laughs> but why? Because, because there's so much wonderful things in community. We're made for it. You know, we're made for a relationship and to be with other people and to support each other. We're not meant to do this alone, but at the same time, there's, a lot that comes with it uh you getting along with people is not easy and it takes sacrifice and i mean it the, what are you willing to give up for community what are you willing to give up to live with other people um and yeah anyway I have that desire, but I I also don't have that. I also don't have that desire to be in that situation again. I'm enjoying my autonomy. I'm enjoying being able to do whatever I want without having to ask permission. I'm really enjoying that. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> I enjoy that as well, very much. That's the basis of my life. Do yes. things that no one asked me to do, and then they turn out well. Don't have to ask yep. for permission. So, yeah. Uh, yep. It sounds like yeah. I listened to the conversation again with Nat this morning and uh I'm kind of getting the sense between talking to you now and listening to that again it was you know about a year ago that we talked on that recording and it's like it sounds like you both want community and you're even willing to pay a price for it but not the price of your autonomy or freedom and you want to find a community where you can be who you are yourselves Nat and Martha and your family Mm-hmm. uh in connection with other people and so it's like not worth connection if you have to give up oh i'm nat or oh i'm martha or oh i'm our children we have you know we we care about our children being free in the way that we care about being free and that's yeah. that's not easy but i wouldn't be surprised if we fast forwarded mm-hmm. three or five years and then you know mm-hmm. there's a community around you in some way yeah i mean the kind of community would It would have to be kind of like how we described our own household, Mm -hmm. where we're all independent operators under one roof, you know, and we get to do things together. That's the joy of it is we get to 
live with each other and do things together, but there's not like these strict like meal times or this time, this time, and this time, and you're going to cook for everyone this day. And you're going to cook for everyone this day. And, and if you want any money, you have to ask for this and it needs to be approved. And, or, I mean, you know, so that's not really independent operators. So yeah, if, if we were to be part of a community, it would have to be kind of like what we have right now, but bigger. And that's what we want for our kids too. Cause even though we've given them each other like they have siblings that's great that's better than being alone that more is better <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah so i i would you you can hope hope for for us okay i i think that we i mean you wouldn't have hoped three or five years ago that you get a hundred thousand dollar fellowship or you exactly. know that you would be in the rv or you know any exactly. of the stuff that's happened to you so and that's one of the things on my list. We did this thing. We did this thing that I forget what he called it, but for 10 days, you like write a whole page of things you want to see more in your life. And then at the end of the 10 days, you take from those lists, like the repeating things and make like a master list. And then you uh, just read the master list a few days. Um, and I did that just recently. And that's one of the things that came up is just, Believing that all things are possible, all things are possible with God. Mm -hmm. Just believing that more and more. So even if it seems impossible that such a thing could happen, it's not. And even just having the courage to admit that I desire it, even though it seems impossible, that it takes courage to admit you desire something, especially if it seems impossible, you know, because then you have to acknowledge the pain too. You have to acknowledge the pain of not having it and not seeing a way to get it. Mm. So, oh, right. And, you know, yeah, anyway, I, I know that it just occurred to me, I'm I'm talk, talking to someone who, who believe, uh, the, the Buddhist philosophy is like desire. What What is it? Like desire is the cause of all pain, right? Or yeah, like or, attachment to attachment is, yes. Yeah. But yeah. I, I mean... And so supposedly like getting rid of desire will also get rid of pain. But it, it, like in my spirituality, I've been encouraged to desire more mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. embrace the pain. Like, yeah, it's going to be painful, but desire more. Like it'll, it'll lead you where you need to go. Uh, and amazing things will happen. So anyway, yeah. Not being afraid of desire, not being afraid of pain. Mm. I mean, you know, don't be afraid. But anyway, hmm. that's my life. <laughs> well, it's been beautiful to witness it. And thank you for <laughs> speaking with me today and sharing yourself so fully. And, you know, I'll be very curious to see how this fellowship goes for you and Nat and also see what happens with your family and uh, yeah, keep an eye on that. So thank you so much. Thank you, Tasha. This has been a lot of fun. <laughs> I forgot we were being recorded for a while, which is a good thing. Ideal. Like, I'm just perfect. talking to you. This is good. That's right. <laughs> awesome.